Yo, people. A very How loud is warm it? Welcome from my side to all of you. My name is Andreas Novi, all of Vienna. Built around the time Karl Polanyi was born, 1886. It was the beginning of okay, I mean, the sound Ghetto, which made Vienna a world city, a cosmopolitan center of intellectual and artistic life. Their, their sound himself mixing is always ass. Of the first decades of his life in Budapest, a modern like, city completely. <laughs> in a peripheral country. After the First World War, he returned to Vienna. The city was then ruled by social democracy and red Vienna became a symbol of a reformist project that gave dignity to its inhabitants, not only the middle classes and the cosmopolites, but also the working class and the former excluded. Kari Polani Levit, daughter of Karl Polani and Ilona Tuczynska, was born in Red Vienna in 1923. She left the city in 1934 due to Austro-Fascism, but she continued her attachment to her place of birth. And it was her insistence that first in 2018, Jeez. the International Karl Polanyi Society was founded. Founded at the Institute for Multilevel Governance and Development at WU Vienna. And Kari Polanyi is the honorary president of our society. And in 2021, due to the initiative of Bernhard Kittel, professor at University of Vienna, three universities, the University of Vienna, Central Uni uh, European University, and WU Vienna set up the Vienna Karl Polanyi Visiting yeah, it's, Professorship. It's just like... Together with Vienna Adult Education. At the moment, it's simply just like talk, talk, talk. Um, the real thing is going to start in about 10 minutes, as far as like, at, if we trust the plan. Um, trust God's plan. <laughs> um, so yeah, stay around like for 10 minutes and then it's really f kicking off. I also have to get my, my pizza real quick. Don't let it burn. So yeah, but make it cozy, make it cozy. Visiting professorship brings outstanding international scholars to Vienna to deepen our understanding of the ongoing transformations. A challenge which gained in importance with the pandemic that has changed our lives. While the Austrian school of Ludwig Mises and Friedrich Hayek has led to an overtly simplistic understanding of market economies, and has increased inequality and social polarization over the last decades, the Hungarian-Austrian Viennese citizen of the world, Karl Polanyi, has dedicated his life to promoting economic systems that serve human cooperation and solidarity, to put the economy in its place. And this place is to sustain a good life for all, but as we know today, without trespassing planetary boundaries. A huge challenge and a challenge that has motivated our first visiting professor, Nancy Fraser as well. But more about this in a few minutes. Before, we have four welcome addresses by the International Karl Polanyi Society and the three organizing universities. I will start with the Univer Vienna University of Economics and Business. Professor Sigrid Stagl is full professor at the Institute for Ecological Economics at WU. She was program director of the master program Social Ecological Economics and Policy, is director of the Competence Center of Sustainability, Transformation and Responsibility, and currently chair of the Department of Socioeconomics. She has published widely in the field of human behavior, sustainable work, the impact of financialization on the environment, and social ecological transformation. She will give her welcome address in the name of Edeltraut Hanapi Ecker, Rector of Vienna University of Economics and Business. Professor Stagel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening. 
And this is just the beginning. It's it's not the real lecture yet. Okay, the sound issues are on their side. You have to remember this is like academia, acad academia, so they don't know technical shit at all. Like, yeah. I don't know. Our very disciplines we come from. And therefore, we bring these insights back into our discipline and thereby hopefully improving um, the insights and knowledge in economics, sociology, um, and the other disciplines. So, this is our department of social economics, and this is how we see markets um, in, in today's world. Uh, we do this in research, uh, we do this um, in teaching. Uh, we have um, Few master's programs. We try the uh, master's program in, in socioeconomy, which is a German language program, and the English language program that um, my colleague Andrea Tomi just mentioned, the socioecological economics. And it's really the socioecological economics notion of understanding the economy, um, which um, is um, sort of what brings us together. Ideally, we would like to call it economics, but no, uh, it's the embedded vision of the economy. The economy being embedded in society and being embedded in the biophysical sphere. Um, this is where we start uh, with. And um, this is something probably that also reminds us tonight. And I'm very much looking forward um, to tonight's keynote speech, but also to the other contributions. A very warm welcome on behalf of the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Thank you very much, Sigrid Stagel. Bernhard Kittel is professor of economic sociology at the University of Vienna. He was deputy dean for research at the Faculty of Economic Sciences and is currently director of the Austrian Corona Panel Project. He works at the intersection of sociology, political science, and economics, currently contributing to the field of labor markets, just My pizza is a little bit crispy, but yeah, and still edible and positions. still good, I think. Recent papers have been published widely, including in journals like Social Science Research, Experimental Economics, the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences. Professor Kittel, we are looking forward to your welcome address. Thank you very much. And dear Nancy Fraser, honorable speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Dean of the Faculty of Business Economics and Statistics of the University of Vienna, Gerhard Stolga. Bro, how is the audio this bad? Seriously. To me, about one and a half years ago, having been vice dean of research at that time, I approached the Chamber of Labor asking whether they were interested in sponsoring a new guest professorship at our faculty. The professorship should take up and reinterpret the heritage of social scientific thinking of the times in which Vienna could pride itself of being one of the centers of the arts and sciences in Europe and beyond, before this vibrant intellectual life was wiped out by foster fascism and the Nazi regime. We soon agreed that Karl Polanyi personifies the idea that we had in mind. Also, 
a guest professorship to the honor of Karl Polanyi is a perfect complement to the Paul Latzer guest professorship at the Faculty of Social Sciences. This focus also provides a welcome addition to the two guest professorships which have already been installed at my own faculty. One, funded by the Austrian National Bank, aims at fostering financial economics in Austria. The other, funded by the Vienna Economic Chamber, is intended to infuse new life thinking the spirit of Friedrich August von Hayek. Out of these initial reflections was born the idea to engage in a joint endeavor with the Vienna University of Economics and the Central European University, which has just experienced what it means to be exposed by a liberal political regime. Given our ambition to cooperate between the three universities hosting the social sciences in Vienna, the city of Vienna enthusiastically joined the project as a second spot. This cooperation with the city of Vienna resulted also in the recruitment of a further partner, the Vienna Community College. In the 1920s and 1930s, this institution has been a recourse for social democratic and Jewish scholars who were kept out of or banned from the University of Vienna. I am very happy about this partner who I am convinced will foster the exchange between academia and the wider society even more. For purely administrative convenience, we channel the funding from the city of Vienna to the Vienna University of Business and Economics, the funding of the Chamber of Labor to the University of Vienna, while maintaining the spirit of community in all practical respects in joint team. With Nancy Fraser, we are delighted to welcome a scholar who is not only well acquainted with the work of Karl Polanyi, but who can, as a political philosopher, also lay some fundamental groundwork for the first development of the guest professorship. Nancy Fraser, once again, many thanks for joining us here and looking forward to hearing your presentation. I'm also delighted to announce the virtual presence today of the person who is the designated holder of the next call, Polanyi Guest Professorship, to be located at the University of Vienna in the autumn of this year, Fred Block of the University of California, Davis. Fred Block, many thanks for joining us today. I'm looking forward to welcoming you in autumn of this year, hopefully. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Bernhard Kittel. Livio Mattei is Provost of Central European University and a Professor of Higher Education Policy. He taught at universities in Romania, Hungary, and conducted applied policy research for a broad range of institutions, including the World Bank, UNESCO, and the European Commission. He is a member of the Board of Trustees of the American University of Central Asia and serves at the editorial boards of the Internationalization of Higher Education Journal and the European Journal of Higher Education. His primary area of expertise include university governance, funding, internationalization of higher education, academic freedom, and university autonomy. Professor Mate, who is the first uh, speaker besides me present in the Wappensaal, we are looking forward to your welcome address. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It is good to be back to the City Hall, although there is not too many of us uh, now in the, in the room, but I know that there are many colleagues uh, um, online, and I am, I am bringing warm greetings to all of those who are here and all those who are uh, online colleagues from uh, Austrian, but also, as I understand, Hungarian universities, and uh, also from a Greek university and from um, the, uh, the Polanyi Society. Now, speaking of Hungarian and Austrian universities, my university, Central European University, is probably the only one that is Austrian and Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian, although I should say more and more Austrian and less and less uh, Hungarian uh, due to circumstances that are known to, to all of us. I would not like, to, I would not try to draw a parallel between the uh, personal trajectory of Karl Polanyi and the institutional trajectory of CEU moving from uh, or between the two capitals uh, 
uh, and then, uh, then further on. But what I would like to do is to thank uh, everybody who played a role in the establishment of, uh, of this chair. This is, this is a, a great initiative and we at CEU are very happy to, to be part of it. And I'm saying this because um, I think there is a certain uh, neglect um, in um, several disciplines that were in the uh, um, academic areas that were represented by uh, Karl Polanyi. There is a certain neglect of his uh, contributions and I very much hope that the establishment of this chair will help to, to take forward his uh, intellectual legacy for the benefit of the uh, education of um, new generations of st students but also for, for research in these areas. And let me just perhaps illustrate with uh, two short examples what do I mean by a certain neglect uh, with regard to, to the contributions and the, the, the relevance today of of the work of, of Karl Polanyi. Um, I am probably one of the few in this uh, audience, physical and online, who is not an economist. I studied philosophy in Romania in the, in the early 90s, in the early 80s, I'm sorry, even longer time ago. And at that time, that was a very good uh, school of philosophy, and we read uh, everybody who was uh, relevant uh, in, in various philosophical uh, areas, including Hungarian authors. So we read not only Lukács in the, um, this was again in the 80s of the, of the last century, but also Agnes Heller, who was uh, uh, still a, a young uh, philosopher at that time. We never read Polanyi. Polanyi was never mentioned during my undergraduate studies in, in philosophy of uh, four years. It was a discovery for me afterwards to, to, to realize how much he has contributed not only to political economy but also to, to, other, to other disciplines. So this is one example of what I call a relative uh, neglect of, uh, of, uh, of his uh, contributions. Another one which made me um, uh, think a lot about uh, in, the, in the process of establishing this, this chair, my university is a central European university and uh, we have been established um, with roots in the intellectual legacy of Central and Eastern Europe. And we speak quite a lot still today on, on our campus about Karl Popper, for sure, about uh, other you know, um, scholars and, uh, and intellectuals. We don't speak a lot about Karl Polanyi and not a lot outside economics and political science and international relations, in particular those who deal with international political economy. And that is quite surprising because in a way, intellectually, Karl Popper is one of the founding references of Central European University, if not a founding father, which obviously he is, he is not. So once again, I think this is a wonderful initiative. I would like to thank everybody who contributed to establishing it. I would also like to, to greet the two first holders of the chair and not, uh, not at the end of everything, I would like to thank the, the city for uh, very generously supporting this initiative. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Livio Mattei. I just want to add uh, one of the few persons present here in this uh, room is also Carsten Schneider from Central European University and he was one of the co-organizers of this event. So thank you very much, Carsten, for your contribution as well. Yeah, and another uh, speaker before coming to uh, the inauguration in itself, uh, uh, the last uh, virtual guest uh, in the welcome addresses is Maria Macantonato. She is assistant professor in political sociology at the University of the Aegean in Lesbos, Greece. She has, a, she has been a postdoctoral fellow at Humboldt University at the Kolleg Postwachstumsgesellschaft, at Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, and at the Max Planck Institute for the study of societies. In 2019, she published, co-edited the book, Karl Polanyi's Political and Economic Thought, a critical guide together with Christopher Holmes and Garrett Dale. She is member of the board of the International Karl Polanyi Society. Professor Macantonato, we are looking forward to your welcome address.
Good morning or good evening to everyone. On behalf of the International Kalpolani Society and as a member of its board, I would like to welcome Professor Nancy Fraser, a renowned international scholar in social sciences, as our first visiting professor in the frame of our new project beginning in the spring semester 2021, Kalpolani Visiting Professorship, a cooperation of the University of Vienna, of the Central European University, the International Kalpolani Society and the Volkshochschule Wien. The International Kalpolani Society is a scientific academic association inspired by the work of Karl Polanyi, aiming to enrich and broaden research in the many directions he has opened. Beyond its scientific character, the International Karl Polanyi Society is also an association of engaged citizens, teachers, activists, journalists and professionals from diverse policy fields who draw on the rich intellectual, moral and political legacy of Polanyi and the public debates he has inspired. In line with Polanyi's orientations, the society strives for an extension of democratic principles to social organization through both economic democratization and political participation and the balance between the individual right to choose and the societal necessity of a democratic polity to create infrastructure that enable freedom for all. In an age of rapid technological advances and digitalization, Polanyi's concerns about the humankind's futures threatened by industrial civilization are set again. Commodification, a process well explained by Polanyi, together with dominant economistic and managerial approaches to modern social problems, threaten today such public goods as healthcare and education, and weaken the welfare state and democratic citizenship. In the spirit of Polanyi's ideas on the importance of uh, society's own experiments, the society invites collectivities, trade union members, activists and citizens to experiment with social innovations that go beyond the current market society and focus on social, ecological, cultural and economic needs rather than profit priorities. The society's aim is also to reconsider the political sphere as the domain of the common good, public dialogue and democratic social organization. With that said, on behalf of the International Kalpolani Society, I would like to warmly welcome Professor Nancy Fraser to inaugurate the Kalpolani Visiting Professorship and wish her a fruitful collaboration. Thank you very much, Professor Macantonato. A short point. In the name I actually, of the, the mayor of Vienna, Michael I actually Ludwig, saw Nancy Fraser live Veronica in Berlin Kaut once. Hasler, yeah. <laughs> present here, will inaugurate the first <coughs> Vienna. She was Polani like there were, were a couple of like intellectuals who were like high high profile. To Professor Nancy Fraser. And um, Didier Eribon also was there and was great. Nancy Fraser, like, <laughs> really wasn't wasn't um, nice with Didier Eribon. Like, she critiqued Eribon, like, very much, which I really liked. <laughs> er Eribon is a fucking pussy. I fucking don't like Eribon. Eribon is boring as fuck. Juries from... 2008 to 18 member of the University Board of the University of Music and Performing Arts Vienna. From 2006 to 2017, she has been director of the Contemporary Arts Festival Steirischer Herbst in Graz. And since 2018, she has been executive city councillor for cultural affairs and science of the city of Vienna. Veronika Kaupasler, we are very happy that you are here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, dear Professor Fraser, dear Professor Dörre, 
die Professor Novi, die Professor Stagel, Professor Kittel, die Professor Matei, die Professor Macanton Artu und uh, die Professor Aulenbacher, distinguished guests wherever you are. It is a pleasure and an honor to welcome you on behalf of the city of Vienna. I'm honored to inaugurate the newly founded Polanyi Visiting Professorship here in Vienna. Please welcome together with me, Nancy Fraser, the first scholar to hold the professorship. Let's make it like this. In his book, The Great Transformation, Karl Polanyi focused not only on the raising importance of machines in the economy and how the industrial organization became more and more efficient, but he also took a close look at what these changes did to society, how the role of the state changed, and finally, how capitalism in its present form evolved. Today, most of the figures of capitalist thought are close to what his brother Michael Polanyi called tacit knowledge. This principle root deeply in us, and they are affirmed day by day up to the point where they became normal and side effects are just commonly accepted. Karl Polanyi argued that the race in productivity doesn't come cost free. Tremendous inequalities, unemployment, business cycles and other side effects put high costs and pressure on societies. The city of Vienna is a social democratic gravitation center in Austria and in Europe. Side effects of capitalism were tackled head on and since the early 1920s, social housing is part of our city culture. The distribution of land and real estate play a significant role in Polanyi's analysis as in Vienna's housing policies. The city of Vienna is by far the biggest landowner in the city, offers 440,000 apartments and houses, so 60% of the population live at reduced rent in so-called Gemeindebauten, social housings, all over the city. The market power of the city of Vienna in the real estate market is significant, and it shows that state intervention and regulation can, if not solve the problem, so at least ease the pain on a regional level. As a result, we are voted the, the most livable city in the quality of living city ranking, and that, believe it or not, is in the end also linked to Karl Polanyi's work. 77 years after the publication of The Great Transformation, it is still in print. It hasn't lost its appeal, and this is why the city of Vienna decided to honor one of Austrian's greatest economists, who is not a representative of the Austrian School of Economics, which he criticized very vocally oh, as a senior people. editor of the magazine. Der It's going to begin, actually, Austrian really economists. soon. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> when we started to come up with fucking the program, formalities only a small of number academia. of people knew that Wuhan is a city in China. The words and phrases pandemic, social distancing, herd immunity, vaccination, quota, and many more were not in anyone's active vocabulary. Since then, the world faced a very rapid and dramatic transformation. Suddenly, social life went from a healthy and necessary activity to being a hazard. The social impact of COVID-19 will be tremendous in the years to come. And I want to encourage as many economists, sociologists, philosophers, academics, and intellectuals to work on this transformation as it will have a significant influence on the next decades. Not only that we need to bring down unemployment, and start our lives again, but to come up with the alternative forms of societal and industrial organization. Yo, um, Vocho, I actually met Nancy Fraser once in Berlin when I was at a big conference where like a lot of like high profile left academics. Okay, and I'm also gonna like to this midnight at like midnight actually, I'm gonna stream the Jacobin live stream because it's also like it's how the rich cause climate change with Matt Huber. Um, so I'm also gonna stream that. I also have a have a um, I also met Chantal Move and have a selfie with Chantal Move. Um, yeah.
<clears throat> like I, I said, okay, hey, um, and this, the talk's gonna start soon, by the way. Um, I told to myself, okay, hey, Nancy, like not Nancy Fraser. Nancy Fraser looked good and and healthy and everything, but um, Chantal Mouffe looked really fucking old, and I thought to myself, okay, hey, better, better snap a pic with her before she dies. <laughs> Yes. She is vice president of the International Karl Polanyi Society and in 2019 she received together with colleagues the Kurt Rothschild Award for her work on Karl Polanyi. Professor Aulenbacher, she is also present. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this warm welcome and good evening to everybody. Perhaps uh, for some of you, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, it is great honor and an equally great challenge to deliver this speech in recognition of Nancy Fraser's work. And I'm delighted to be doing so on behalf of the International Karl Polanyi Society. The last time my colleagues and I from the International Karl Polanyi Society met Nancy Fraser was two years ago. It was at an event at Bennington College in Vermont on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the publication of Karl Polanyi's magnum opus, The Great Transformation, which he had written at the college. It perhaps came as no surprise to those who know Nancy Fraser when she said at that event that she would in fact consider herself as Marxist or Marxian rather than Polanyan. It would have probably seen just an unsurprising had she said, for example, that she considered herself a feminist. At the time, we had no idea that a visiting professorship in Karl Polanyi's name would be created in Vienna, the city hey, people. that had um, such an impact on him. I'm sorry, this is just like a lot of academic formalities in the beginning. Um, I didn't knew, like the, the lecture was... <laughs> yeah, um, I mean the talk was scheduled for for fifth, eight, eight, fifteen p.m., they're now like twenty minutes over when the lecture was supposed to start. <laughs> yeah, of the yeah with the what the one person. <laughs> Which we seek to encourage in the spirit of Polanyi and in the light of this year's motto, counter-movements, putting the economy in its place. Intellectual traditions. Nancy Fraser is a social philosopher and effortlessly crosses the boundaries between disciplines. At times, we encounter thoughts and ideas related to political science at other times to sociology, alongside her philosophical reflections. What remains constant, however, is that her ideas are always rooted in long-standing to intellectual traditions. As the internationally renowned representative of critical theory that she is, Nancy Fraser has always sought to engage with Jürgen Habermas. Her theory of justice developed out of the controversy with Axel Honneth. Her analysis of capitalism and society in turn is strongly influenced by Marx. Finally, we find Polanyi's work inscribed in her theory of the society as well as reference to Antonio Gramsci. 
In her conversation in Critical Theory with Rahel Yegi, she brings all these distinct intellectual traditions together. So can we, in fact, identify a common theme? In my view, her ultimate objective, as she spelled out with Axel Honneth in the tradition of critical theory, is to concept conceptualize capitalist society as a totality. Her aim is to no. discern the social structures and interrelationships that cause the ecological, economic, social, cultural, and political crisis we have never witnessed over Never the past talk about decades. totality ever again. <laughs> Understanding this development of society, the feminist, Nancy Fraser explains, requires a broadening of the perspective on capitalism and society in two ways. Firstly, we need an analysis of capitalism that regards not only class inequalities, but also the relations of gender and race as constitutive of this social formation. According to Nancy Fraser, capitalism as such cannot be separated from sexism. What, what the guy in the, or the person in the, um, in the chat is saying, so fucking true with the, like, I mean, what these academics are talking, that the lack of enthusiasm of speakers is really depressing. Like, I mean, that's just German or like then Austrian academia, like German speaking academia. We are fucking, we lack enthusiasm. And then what, what these academics are talking about are very central issues of our time. Can't you be a little bit more engages, engaging for God's sake? <laughs> so fucking true. Like, I also don't like just yeah. Okay, let's, let's listen to her. She's actually talking about something that's interesting. Black Lives Matter movement and has led Nancy Fraser to speak of racial capitalism. In my understanding, Nancy Fraser seeks to develop a feminist and intersectional theory of justice and an analysis and critic of capitalism that traces the relations of dominance and causes of crisis to the economy and the relation between economy, ecology, and society, while at the same time pursuing emancipatory change. The theory of justice. Nancy Fraser's theory of justice developed at the end of the last and the beginning of this century is highly relevant and topical, as we shall see in the following. In her widely acknowledged concept of so social justice, she combines what has been separated historically, the topics of redistribution and recognition, commonly more closely associated with the old left or the new left, she uh, names, under the label of class politics or identity politics, respectively. And she reflects on this issue of the representation of people in a globalized world, the nation state based structure of which does not provide for the participation of all people, even in democracies. Nancy Fraser's three dimensional concept of social ju justice focuses on economy, culture, and politics as the domains that structure and determine the practice of social life. A just society, according to Fraser, can be measured by the extent to which the norm of participatory parity of all members of society has been established. The path to such a society is marked by struggles for redistribution, recognition, and representation in the course with, of which marginalized and discriminated groups in Just short what I meant with the, the two categories, um, the categories of like re 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 redistribution and recognition, that both of those are like recognition is simply in the liberal framework, whereas redistribution is only in the social democratic framework 
and um, like it doesn't go to the core of like capital. Like you can have capital with revenue distribution, which will then set up against again dynamics of monopolization and social inequality. Um, maybe you can do something with Keynesianism, um, but still it's like both like oh my god, she combines recognition and redistribution. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's let's let's. I'm I'm interested in the talk actually. Like, okay, now it's interesting about capitalism. She's Lani, talking. Nancy Fraser notes that two Karls are better than one. For each of these Karls affords some indispensable indispensable insights for understanding capitalist crisis. According to Nancy Fraser, society is suffering from a fundamental contradiction inherent in capitalism. Building on Marx, she defines this contradiction as follows. The accu accumulation-driven dynamic of the capitalist mode of production destroys the very foundations of social and ecological reproduction on which production relies for its own functioning. Here, her perspective focuses on the relations of ownership, exploitation, and alienation, which subordinate humanity and nature to the logic of capital valuation and accumulation, and which is where the appropriation of surplus value and the wealth redistribution in favor of the 1% takes place. Yet this Karl Marx, she argues, is too fixated on the inner economic processes. Nancy Fraser considers the other Karl Polanyi, by contrast, to be the best theorist of crisis of our times. His concept of fictitious commodities, according to which the destructive commodification of land, labor, and money in line with the requirements of the self-regulated markets leads to the demolition of society, so Polanyi. And it explains the more recent ecological, finance, economic, and social and political crisis. To some extent, however, Nancy Fraser is at odds with this Karl as well, even though he does address the relation between economy and society, society seems to remain a black box. Correspondingly, Nancy Fraser's own approach differs. The decision about what is to be organized in a marketized, private, commercial, familial, or state-coordinated form, and in what way this is linked to social inequalities, occurs not only in the economy or in the relation between economy and society. It occurs also in border struggles, her term, that develop along the social institutional order of capitalism and are closely linked to the division of labor. While Polanyi considers his history to be the result of a double movement, uh, the movement of the market fundamentalist commodification of land, labor, and money, and the counter movements through which society seeks to protect itself from the consequences of the market dynamics, Nancy Fraser proposes her concept of a triple movement. It is Close to her three-dimensional conception of social justice, this concept includes those social protests and struggles that are neither of the Marxian type, directed against exploitation, nor of the Polanyan type, seeking for protection, but which pursue the goal of emancipation in the sense of recognition, which may be linked to a critic of exploitation and market fundamentalism but necessarily not so. The analysis of contemporary crisis. Nancy Fraser sparks debate. It would like, I would like to illustrate this based on two examples. The first pertains to populism, the second to feminism. With respect to populism, Nancy Fraser emphasizes the path from progressive to reactionary and to hyper-reactionary -re neoliberalism not only in the United States. In her view, these developments were and continue to be before, during, and after the financial crisis, the cause of economic, ecological, and social crisis and social inequalities and polarizations. 
while also leasing, leading to far-reaching shifts in the relations between capitalism and democracy. Alongside the rise of anti-democratic forces, the latter includes the destabilization of the political institutions which the capitalist market economy relies on for its functioning. Given that it does not exist independently from society, as Karl Polanyi made clear. To Nancy Fraser, today's crisis of democracy is a dimension of the capitalist crisis as neoliberalism is stretched to its limits. Drawing on Gramsci, she speaks of an interregnum in which the old is dying and the new cannot be born and of an hegemonic gap as well as the struggle to fill it as regards the chances to, of managing to form a counter-hegemonic block in light of a society shaken by crisis, she provocatively states that the current situation leaves progressive populism as the likeliest candidate. To her, redistribution and recognition are topics through which progressive populism can reach people and thus change conditions considering the existential social uncertainties felt by large parts of the population and the struggles discriminated groups face to assert their rights. Regarding my second example to Nancy Fraser, the history of neoliberalism is also one of the co-optation of feminism. Policies of gender inequality in the context of the given economic order have helped only very few women to climb up the social and professional ladder and achieve real success while the 99% suffer the consequences of the economic, ecological, social and political crisis. Nancy Fraser has provided inspiring contributions to the debate across a wide range of feminist and intersectional critics of capitalism, always with the ob objective of reversing the subordination of social, ecological reproduction to economic production. With regard to our motto, this also includes putting the economy in its place instead of, in the words of Karl Polanyi, degrading society to the status of an accessory of the market. The vision for the future. Nancy Fraser's work is pervaded by a holistic view on economic, social, cultural, and political claims to egalitarian distribution and equal recognition and participation. In the last chapter of his main work entitled Freedom in a Complex Society, Karl Polanyi envisages a society that could be just and free when the utopian experiment of a self-regulating market will be no more than a memory. In this society, the right to non-conformity, Polanyi term, as a form of individual freedom would take center stage just as much as the organization and structuring of society in a way that would break with the structures of privilege and the existing, the existing economic organization. Nancy Fraser's vision for the future is one of ecological socialism, in which the centralism of the failed socialist systems is entirely aligned, in which the relations of ownership and economic organization are subjected to a radical democratic restructuring, and in which it ultimately becomes a collective decision which growth paths are chosen, and how and for what purposes surplus is actually used. When comparing both Karl Polanyi's and Nancy Fraser's conceptions of a just and free socialist society, it turns out that they may have far more in common than is often assumed. Today and in the coming, day, coming days, we can look forward to being part of some exciting discussions with our very first Karl Polanyi visiting professorship Nancy Fraser, contributing to the intellectual counter moves of our time. Thank you very much. Oh my fucking God. Holy shit. Holy shit. Finally.
Thank you very much, Brigitte Allenbach. Bro, for please for just start. Laudatio. Fuck, bro. This event today is part of a lecture series of Austrian universities. They just mentioned one plus the Vienna Technical University and organizations of public. Okay, fuck you. I just found an interesting YouTube channel, which I will link in the YouTube chat in the chat. Um, it's called Red May TV, who have some cool, interesting content. Um, yeah, gonna send you the link in the in the in the comments. Check it out. Subscribe. Applied Development Studies and the Austrian Society for Political Education. Yeah, and now, <clears throat> uh, dear Nancy Fraser, uh, far away. Uh, on the other side of oh the Atlantic. Oh my god, please let Nancy Fraser Welcome have at least Vienna. decent audio, uh, please. Uh, we have, we imagined a different uh, inauguration. Uh, we planned it already for October 2020, uh, and then due to the pandemic, we postponed it for one semester. Uh, and in this semester, we decided better to have a virtual visiting professor than none. Uh, and whatever the future will bring, uh, better to have this in this semester. And so we have a PhD seminar with you that already started. We have these lectures uh, during this week. Uh, and uh, this is the room where you would have spoken. Uh, would you have been here in Vienna? Uh, we very much look forward for another opportunity to have you in Vienna physically, but we are very, very happy that uh, this virtual event is taking place today. And the great advantage of the internet is that we have an, a very international audience uh, coming from all parts of this planet. <clears throat> Before finally giving the the floor to you and your keynote speech, just a few additional biographical informations in addition to what Brigitte Aulenbacher has already presented. Nancy Fraser is Henry A. L and Louise Loeb Professor of Philosophy and Politics, oh. as well as Research Fellow at the Heilbronner Center for Capitalism Studies at the New School for Social Research in New York City. She has received various awards and honors, including the American Philosophical Association's Alfred Schutz Prize in 2010, the French Legion of Honor in 2018, the Nassim Abif World Prize from the University of Geneva in 2018, and the Havens Wright Center Award for lifetime contribution to critical scholarships in 2019 from the University of Wisconsin Medicine. She holds do honorary doctoral degrees from six universities in five countries. And she's authors of several books, and I just mentioned some of the more recent ones, Feminism for the 99%, The Manifesto, co-authored with Cynthia Arusa and Titi Pachacharya, Capitalism, a Conversation in Critical Theory, co-authored with Rahel Yegi, Fortunes of Feminism from State-Managed Capitalism to Neoliberal Crisis, and Scales of Justice, Reimagining Political Space in a Globalizing World. Nancy Fraser will today talk about incinerating nature, why global warming is baked into capitalist society. Dear Nancy, we're looking forward to your keynote. Thank you, finally. Thank you very, very much, uh, Andreas, and to, to all of you who have uh, spoken and, and given me such a, a warm welcome. Uh, it's, Bro, it's fix really your audio. It's sad to be sitting here. I'm actually in a hotel room in Alabama where I've been able to see my Fix your fucking for the audio. First time in over a year. Oh my um, god, the fucking uh, organizers, but man. Why would I love to be in that beautiful uh, city hall uh, with all of you in person? Um, 
I'm, I'm extremely. I can't make it louder. I'm sorry. They have they have it really impressed by all the inter really really low. The, the various universities, the role of the city, the adult education sphere, and and so on. It's it's kind of a model uh, for what I wish we could do uh, in New York. We certainly have the institutions, but we lack the coordination that you apparently have. It's also um, great to, um, to, to be a part of the, um, I don't know if, it, if we should say rediscovery or reappreciation, uh, a more just appreciation of the importance of the thought of Karl Polanyi. Um, it's, um, he's someone who um, made a huge impression on me when I first read him as a college student in the late 1960s, um, and whom I rediscovered uh, again, uh, teaching him at the new school roughly 10 years ago. Bro, come on. And he really insinuated himself into my thinking. Bro. Come on. I'm sorry. So that uh, <sighs> despite the, um, the quote, uh, and, and it's accurate that uh, Brigitte Allenbacher uh, uh, mentioned uh, at the Vermont uh, College Conference where I said I'm not a Polanyan but a Marxist, I, I think it's not entirely an accurate self-description. It might have, something might have pressed my button at that moment. Uh, but um, I think you'll see as I as I get into the, the lecture itself. Bro, well, what is going on? And I do think, although I don't uh, speak of this explicitly, I do think that a lot of what I'm about to say could be read as a gloss on the notion of the fictitious commodification of land. I don't know if that's on my side or what's going on. So no, I, uh, I want to start um, just by um, observing something that I think you, you all uh, already observe, uh, which is that we, we hear a great deal of talk about the Anthropocene. Many, many powerful voices uh, are invoking that. Uh, in order to underline the severity of the present climate crisis. By framing global warming as a new epoch in the historical geology of planet Earth, they are rightly stressing I don't know what's called the momentous no and world-shattering character of this crisis. There is something... Uh. This has to be has to be something on my part, I think. Let's go back like until here and see if that. I do think, although I don't uh, speak of this explicitly, I do think that a lot of what I'm about to say could be read as a gloss on the notion of the fictitious commodification of land. So uh, I want to start um, just by. Um, observing something that I think you, you all uh, already observe, uh, which is that we, we hear a great deal of talk about the Anthropocene. Many, many powerful voices uh, are invoking that term in order to underline the severity of the present climate crisis. By framing global warming as a new epoch in the historical geology of planet Earth, they are rightly stressing the momentous and world-shattering character of this crisis. And by naming the new epoch after Anthropos, 
they are rebuking in an entirely salutary way those who deny any role to our species in bringing us to this pass. By foregrounding the capacity of human action to destroy the conditions of life on the planet, finally, they are calling on us uh, to act decisively, we humans, to act decisively to safeguard those conditions and to safeguard the Earth itself. So you can see this, this talk of Anthropocene is a very powerful rhetoric and it has many, many salutary aspects. And yet, I want to say that there is something profoundly misleading and even diversionary in this choice of terminology. I just, in, in listening to, to Brigitte and, and others, um, I think we could say it is a profoundly disembedded way of trying to understand climate change, because it's simply not the case that the species Homo sapiens sapiens, as such, is the principal socio-historical driver of global warming. It's not humanity in general that has been bombarding the atmosphere with greenhouse gases for the last 200 years. No, that dubious honor belongs, and okay, here I'll use Marxian language, I'm going to be sort of oscillating back and forth between the two Carls, that dubious honor belongs to the class of profit driven entrepreneurs and investors who engineered our fossil fuel system of production and transport. But far from acting contingently by chance or by simple greed, they have done so, I'm going to argue, non-accidentally. That is, in accord with the... Uh, the pauses, I'm sorry, the pauses are on my side. For some reason, my internet can't load. Um, yeah, yeah, oh my god. You, Zero, you weren't even here, like, they were supposed to start the um like they had a plan on when they would start like her actual lecture which was supposed to be like at 8 15 pm and she just started like 10 minutes ago or something and everything before that was like academic formalities like holy fucking shit like bro um and yeah so whenever like like not leftist audio or leftist technical stuff like academic technical stuff like holy shit i also have like a headache and i won't talk like i'm already like quite pissed because of that shit and now because of my internet what's going on here i have it on the lowest possible set no don't do don't sc do 144p please don't try to flex on me internet now um yeah now nah, i don't i don't want to fix anything with the with the mic um, um, I mean, it's a live stream that you can like also then play back and so, so we, we don't miss anything. Yeah. The structurally entrenched imperatives of a specific social system, not humanity in general then, but capitalist society's version of humanity has brought us global warming. Capitalism, in a sense, I'm going to define soon represents, I claim, the socio-historical driver of climate change and therefore the core institutionalized dynamic that must be dismantled in order to stop it. Eco-politics, I'm going to maintain, must become anti-capitalist. But that's not all. Capitalism in the sense that I'm going to elaborate is also deeply implicated in seemingly non-ecological forms of societal injustice, from class exploitation to racial imperial oppression to gender and sexual domination. And capitalism figures centrally too in seemingly non-ecological societal impasses in crises of care and social reproduction of finance, supply chains, wages, and work, of dispossession, expulsion, and exclusion of migrants, 
of governance, militarization, and what's been called de-democratization. Rooted in the same social system that has brought us global warming, these strands of our present crisis are thoroughly entangled with it. So much so that an ecopolitics capable of saving the planet cannot proceed in isolation from them. As well as being anti-capitalist then, ecopolitics must also be trans-environmental. And I'll explain what I mean by that shortly. Anyway, that's the thesis I want to try to argue here over the course of this lecture and a follow-up that I'll be giving tomorrow. I'm going to argue this thesis on two different levels, which I think complement and reinforce one another. Today, then, I'll make the case in terms of social structure. I'll give a structural argument to the effect that capitalism, rightly understood, harbors a deep-seated ecological contradiction, which inclines it non-accidentally to environmental crisis. But far from standing alone, I claim that contradiction is entwined with several others, which are equally endemic. I don't know what's going on. Maybe my my neighbor is like, for some reason, like this, I really have it to the lowest of lowest settings. What's so fucking ever. Um, yeah, but what I wanted to say, um, I'm like, probably because of my headache, I won't stream the Jacobin stream tonight. Um, because it's, I'm probably gonna watch it, but like not, not uh, stream it. So I just posted you the link to the Jacobin stream. Um, which is called um, why the how the rich caused climate change. Yeah, and by Matt Huber, who Matt Matt, Matt Huber is a really good commentator. Like, it sounds really polemic the, the the title, but Matt Huber is a really good writer on like the relation of class struggle and climate change. And um, so check that out. Um, yeah, and now let's continue. To capitalism and cannot be adequately addressed in abstraction from them. Now, in the follow-up lecture tomorrow, I'll just mention that I'll be shifting uh, to the plane of history, charting some of the specific forms that capitalism's ecological contradiction has assumed in the various phases of the system's development. And I'll be arguing that contra single issue environmentalism this history discloses the pervasive entanglement of eco-crisis and eco-struggle with other strands of crisis and struggle from which they have never been fully separable in the history of capitalism. So in, in both lectures, then, the conclusion is one and the same. And eco-politics for our time must be anti-capitalist and trans-environmental. Well, what what does it mean to say that capitalism is the principal socio-historical driver of global warming? At one level, obviously, this claim is empirical, a statement of cause and effect, against the usual vague references to the Anthropocene or anthropogenic climate change. It pins the rap not on humanity in general, but as I said, on the profit-driven class that engineered the fossil fuel system of production and transport that has released a flood of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's a claim I'll defend empirically in tomorrow's lecture when I turn to the historical portion of the argument, but there is more at work here than historical causality. Capitalism, as I understand it, drives global warming non-accidentally by virtue of its very structure. And it's this strong systematic claim and not its weaker empirical cousin that I want to unpack now. But I have to begin by preempting a possible misunderstanding. To say that capitalism drives climate change non-accidentally is not to say that ecological crises occur only in capitalist societies. On the contrary, many pre-capitalist societies have perished 
as a result of environmental impasses, including some of their own making, as when ancient empires ruined the farmlands on which they depended through deforestation or failure to rotate crops. And in the same way, some self-proclaimed post-capitalist societies have generated severe environmental damage through relentless quotidian coal burning and spectacular one-off disasters such as Chernobyl. Such cases show that ecological devastation is not unique to capitalism. What is unique, however, is the structural character of the link between ecological crisis and capitalist society. Pre-capitalist eco-crises occurred in spite of what I'll call nature-friendly worldviews, and largely thanks to ignorance, failure to anticipate the consequences of deforestation or overplanting. They could have been prevented, and sometimes were, by social learning that prompted shifts in social practice. Nothing in the in inherent dynamics of these societies required the practices that spawned the damages. The same is true, I believe, for self-proclaimed post-capitalist societies. Really existing socialisms practiced unsustainable agricultural and industrial regimens, poisoning the land with chemical fertilizers and fouling the air with CO2. Unlike their pre-capitalist predecessors, of course, their practices aligned with worldviews that were not at all nature friendly, and their actions were shaped by ideological pressures in joining what they call the development of the forces of production. What is crucial, however, is that neither those worldviews nor those pressures arose from dynamics internal to socialism. Their roots lay rather in the geopolitical soil in which these socialisms germinated, in a world system structured by competition with capitalist societies, by the catch-up extractivist mindset that environment fostered, and by the fossil fuel models of mega industrialization favored by it. Now, I want to be clear that in saying this, I do not at all mean to let the rulers of these societies off the hook. They will remain forever culpable, culpable for disastrous decisions made in bureaucratic authoritarian milieus that were saturated with fear and obsessed with secrecy, qualities they deliberately cultivated. The point is rather that nothing in the nature of socialist society as such requires such milieus or such decisions. Absent the prevailing external constraints and internal deformations, such societies could in principle develop sustainable patterns of interaction with non-human nature. The same cannot be said, however, for capitalist societies. They are unique among known social systems in entrenching a deep-seated tendency to ecological crisis at their very core. As I we have to wait for a second here again. Um... But yeah, maybe actually that's kind of interesting <laughs> that I have to that we have to wait for a second to buffer a little bit. Um, I do like the distinction the distinctions she's making here. Um, I just want to say I'm a little bit and a tiny tiny bit skeptical about the distinction between like okay internal logic of for example like really existing socialist states and um their geopolitical context in which they emerged and which they, which they have found themselves um of course like to a limited to a limited degree such a distinction makes sense but um like it's always it's always important to keep in mind i think i think something like systems theory would um um help here to like remember there's like no like 
hard or like ontologically categorical distinction between like okay the environment in which something finds itself and like the system itself um but still you can make a distinction between them and like there are in dynamics internal to the system that are not the dynamics of the environment um that's an important like i'm i'm interested in how she's and also she's not going for the for the productivist uh, critique to saying oh those really existing socialist states were actually based on productivism which then is i think more or less like you have either like an an, an like an idealist explanation or like critique of productivism to say like okay productivism is a specific kind of relation to nature and um that because like in socialist theory and like social politics there was like embodied this kind of um relation to nature like for example i would say like a promethean um relation to nature which only sees nature to be appropriated and to be formed by the human and not as something that is to, to be cherished by itself or something or you have like an i think a lot of ultra leftists fall into that category like some ultra leftists go this route it's like more an economic explanation that they say like they have like critiques of like the value form and say like okay these really existing socialist states were like actually like just just state capital state capitalist states where basically the growth of capital was just managed by the state and not by competition anymore and um but that like the fundamental abstract functioning of the economy didn't change in its core and therefore you have the same relation to the environment like these are the two the two explanations of productivism and but they would both say okay this kind of um environmental environmentally destructive relation to nature is internal and necessary to those well was internal and necessary to those socialist societies and therefore also draw the conclusion okay then we need to have something that's um something like eco-socialism that does learn like or that does is like in the tradition of socialism but still changes some fundamental elements that bring about set destructive uh, relation to nature and they then call it eco-socialism and like which like as their own specific brand that's basically like socialism but without the productivist character and but she isn't going that route this is interesting this is interesting um i'm i'm excited what how she's going here i shall explain a systemic ecological contradiction is inscribed in the dna of capitalist society anchored in its signature institutional structure and developmental dynamics as a result capitalist societies are primed to generate recurrent environmental crises throughout their history. Unlike those of other societies, their ecological impasses cannot be resolved by increased knowledge or by green bona fides. What is required in addition is deep structural transformation. Now to see why, we have to revisit the concept of capitalism. Contrary to the usual view, capitalism is not an economic system, but something bigger. More than a way of organizing economic production and exchange, it is also a way of organizing the relation of production exchange to their non-economic conditions of possibility. This is a deeply Polanyian point I'm making. It is well understood in many quarters that capitalist societies institutionalize a dedicated economic realm, the realm of a peculiar abstraction known as value, where commodities are produced on privately owned means of production by exploited wage labor laborers and where they are sold on price setting markets by private firms, all with the aim of generating profits and accumulating capital. What is too often overlooked, however, is that this realm is constitutively dependent on, one could say parasitic on, a host of social activities, political capacities, and natural processes that are defined in capitalist societies 
as non-economic, accorded no value in this technical sense, and positioned outside the economy, these constitute the economy's indispensable presuppositions. Certainly, commodity production is inconceivable absent the unwaged activities of social reproduction that form and sustain the human beings who perform waged labor. Nor could such production exist apart from the natural processes that assure availability of vital inputs, including raw materials and sources of energy. Neither, finally, would profit or capital be possible without the legal orders, repressive forces, and public goods that underpin private property and contractual exchange. Essential conditions for a capitalist economy, these non-economic instances are not external to capitalism, but integral elements of it. Conceptions of capitalism that omit them are ideological. To equate capitalism with its economy is to parrot the system's own economistic self-understanding and thus to miss the chance to interrogate it critically. To gain a critical perspective, we must understand capitalism broadly as an institutionalized social order that encompasses not only the economy, but also those activities, relations, and processes that make the economy possible. What is gained from this revision is the ability to examine something crucial, namely the relation established in capitalist societies between the economy and its others, including that vital other known as nature. At its core, this relation is contradictory and crisis prone. I just wanted to say, um, I really like this point, and I really like the f like the abstract formulation of okay. Capitalism is not only an economic system, or is not yeah is not only an economic system. It's also a form of organization of the relation of this economic system to its non-economic conditions. Um, so it's not on so you might say okay capitalism is not only um maybe maybe one could say when if we, if you would try to formulate this in like systems theory terms you could say okay capitalism is a system with an internal logic an uh, internal functioning logic that we would then okay in systems who have this specific internal functioning logic we would call capitalism but in order that this system is even able to reproduce itself and to survive, it needs specific environmental conditions, specific inputs. And um, so there is no capitalism without a specific set of inputs. And this specific set of inputs would then be the conditions upon she is formulating this in non econ like i'm just trying to translate it in an abstract systems theoretical framework and maybe that works maybe i'm just like uh, maybe i'm also misunderstanding here but I'm, I'm just trying to do that and she's um so the conditions upon which the reproduction of capitalism um um is dependent upon would then be the environment of the system but in order for capitalism to survive, in order for, for there to be the system that can, for, in order for it to be able that the system reproduces itself, it needs these specific inputs from the environment and um, from its environment. And that, the, like, what kind of inputs it, um, um, capitalism needs and what kind of outputs it gives into its environment and that through this input output dynamic it basically undermines um, its own conditions of reproduction so that um, um, that it through the outputs capitalism the system capitalism generates it basically um, destabilizes and destroys in the long term its environment, the ability of if, if its environment to give it the inputs it needs. Um, 
yeah, maybe that's even more abstract, but maybe that's like a good way of, of thinking about this. Um, I do like that. I do like that. Um, I'm like the only thing I'm I'm uh, um, okay. She's she's obviously talking about okay. It has like an capitalism has a contradictory relation. I never really like. I think the only best way you can use contradictory is really like in systems theory terms, um, in the end or like cybernetic terms, um, to describe or like in game theoretical terms. Like okay, cont where contradictory simply means like mutually exclusive. But contradictory, obviously, in, in this sense, has like a time dynamic. So you can't say, okay, mutually exclusive. Like, because mutually exclusive normally is thought of as like logically and not like happening in time. And, um, um, yeah. I, like, what, what I said, sometimes. I feel like when people say something, yeah, capitalism is not just a system, and it's not just an economic system, it's also like this whole bunch of other social institutional arrangements around it, basically. Um, and then they make capitalism into like a totality, where it's, it's never, it's like basically all of society. And those kind of accounts where really, as I said, okay, there is actually like no outside of capitalism. Everything is like, um, part of this of this totality of capitalism they are simply stupid they are they are not consistent um rob lucas has an amazing article on that um this goes into accounts of real subsumption um, um formal versus real subsumption um yeah like some people tend to do that um uh, which i think is fucking stupid um i do like this okay hey Capitalism is like an economic system, but it also means it has like a specific relation to its environment and Maybe you can say maybe you can do it like I did that. Okay, the system of capitalism needs specific inputs and gives you specific outputs um, But it doesn't necessarily mean Okay, the these inputs from its environment need to come from institutional arrangement x or like they just for example they just need like they just need labor power for example and the wage labor and that means okay there must be for example like historically that that has taken on the form of like the nuclear family in most in a lot of societies in most societies i think um but that doesn't mean that like okay oh as soon as for example like one form of nuclear family or something like um vanishes and develops into something different that doesn't mean like capitalism um capitalism starts to crumble because like everything that capitalism needs is is a specific input and this specific input can be given by different forms by different like forms of family for example um anti-totality point i can't do i can't do it right now um, I would need to go back to the Rob Lucas text, who has like really, really good points about this. But in the end, it's um, I, would, I, I, I don't really remember my like a key argument or something like that. Um, but ba like also just from a strategic standpoint, why the talk about capitalism as a totality is fucking stupid, where there is like okay, there is like literally no outside of capitalism anymore. Um, they are just, they are inconsistent. They're internally contradictory. You can easily prove them wrong with like, like on a categorical, like on the concept level with like simple counter arguments and thought, uh, thought experiments. Um, Malm in, in the progress of the storm also goes into that when people talk about like the relation of nature and society as like, oh, as if like society and humanity has, ha would have like, has like, subsumed all of its na all of nature into its um totality or something like that and it's also fucking stupid um and but from the strategic point it's also like okay hey um then like nothing uh the rob lucas article i can send it to you actually um it's called feeding feeding the inf like uh, feeding the infant um i think it's not even published i think i got it from rob lucas himself and also, there is in EndNotes 5, the Rob Lucas error article, which also goes into this 
from a more abstract perspective where he says for example like when you have like totalities or to categories of totality for example like technology like technology as such and um but like then questions like oh the relation of capital to technology as such is is elaborated and that those kind of questions are stupid and mostly obscure rather than really enlightened but i can send it to you later on discord um like it's a word a doc the feeding of the infant thing where he also works through specific examples of theorists who have gone this totality road and yeah um okay on the one hand the system's economy is constitutively dependent on nature both as a tap for production's inputs and as a sink for disposing its waste at the same time capitalist society institutes a stark division between the two realms constructing economy as a field of creative human action that generates value while positioning nature as a realm of stuff Devo by the way simply sh short comment um because i referenced the eco-socialists uh, earlier and the question of um um if fraser references and is influenced by eco-socialists um for example the concept of the metabolic rift which uh, john bellamy foster who's the return of nature book i showed yesterday <laughs> which arrived yesterday um um the the concept of the metabolic rift which he uncovers in marx's work um i think describes something very similar what she describes right here the metabolic rift is simply what she would say okay the contradictory relation of capital um to its um, conditions of reproduction, to its environmental conditions of reproduction. That um, basically, um, okay, capitalism needs specific inputs from its environment and it gives specific outputs, but if, it, if the relation of those inputs and outputs undermines the ability of the, over the, in the long term, or like on different time scales, but in the long term, most of the time, of this environment to generate to either generate those inputs for example um, um labor power um or to um, absorb these outputs of capitalism um or let's say okay hey you need specific natural resources and um that okay capitalism just dumps so much waste into its environment that this environment like that for example you have a mass extinction event and um, the specific uh, ecological, specific natural resources it need its needs can't be produced anymore or can't be produced in the in the amount they are needed. Then um, that's the contradictory relation of capitalism to its environment. That's what Foster described. That's what that's what the metabolic rift is. That's what metabolic rift means. I think as far as I've understood it so far, and yeah of value but infinitely self-replenishing and generally available to be processed in commodity production without any limits. Now this ontological gulf becomes a raging inferno when capital enters the mix. Capital is a monetized abstraction engineered to self-expand, one that commands capital accumulation without end. The effect is to incentivize owners bent on maximizing profits to commandeer what they consider to be nature's gifts as cheaply as possible, while absolving them of any obligation to replenish what they take and repair what they damage. The damages, in my view, are the flip side of the profits. With their ecological re reproduction costs discounted, all the major inputs to capitalist production and circulation are vastly cheapened, not just raw material, energy, and transport, but also labor, as wages fall with the cost of living when capital risks foodstuffs from nature on the cheap. In every case, capitalists appropriate the savings from cheap inputs in the form of profits, 
while passing the environmental costs to those who must live with and die from the fallout, including future generations of human beings. So what I'm saying is that capital is more than a relation to labor. It's also a relation to nature, a predatory extractive relation, which, which consumes ever more biophysical wealth in order to pile up ever more value while disavowing what the economists would call ecological externalities. But what also piles up non-accidentally is an ever-growing mountain of eco-wreckage, an atmosphere flooded by carbon emissions, climbing temperatures, crumbling polar ice shelves, rising seas clogged with islands of plastic, mass extinctions, declining diversity, and as we're now discovering uh, to our uh, grave peril, climate-driven migrations of organisms and pathogens, increased zoonotic spillovers of deadly viruses, not to mention superstorms, mega droughts, giant locust swarms, jumbo wildflowers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Systemically primed to free ride on a nature that cannot really self-replenish without limit, Capitalism's economy is always on the verge of destabilizing its own ecological conditions of possibility. I think this is another way of talking about the fictitious commodification of land. In any case, here in effect is an ecological contradiction lodged at the heart of capitalist society in the relation the society establishes between economy and nature. Grounded deep in the system structure, this contradiction is encapsulated in four words that begin with the letter D. That is dependence, division, disavowal, and destabilization. In a nutshell, capitalist society makes- And Dick. She forgot Dick. Because it's also patriarchal capitalism. That's, that's, that's why it's also Dick. Most people forget that, but it's also essential, yeah. Economy depend on nature while dividing them ecologic, uh, sorry, ontologically, enjoining endless accumulation of value while defining nature as not partaking of it. This arrangement programs economy to disavow the ecological reproduction costs it generates. The effect is those costs mount exponentially is to destabilize ecosystems and periodically to disrupt the entire jerry-rigged edifice of capitalist society. Simultaneously needing and rubbishing nature, capitalism is a cannibal that devours its own vital organs like a serpent that- Just shall we, I don't know if I have the dick, uh, the, not the dick emote, the yep emote actually. Um, I I consciously didn't choose like to all of the all of the mainstream emotes. I wanted my own emotes. Um, yeah. Eats its own tail. Now the contradiction can also be formulated in a different way, namely in terms of class power. By definition, capitalist societies devolve to capital, or rather to those dedicated to its accumulation the task of organizing production. It is the class of capitalists whom this system licenses to extract raw materials, generate energy, determine land use, engineer food systems, bioprospect medicinals, and dispose of waste, effectively ceding to them the lion's share of control over air and water, soil and minerals, flora and fauna, forests and oceans, atmosphere and climate, in other words, over all the basic conditions that sustain life on earth. Capitalist societies thus vest a class that is strongly motivated to trash nature with the power to manage our relations to it. Now it's true that governments sometimes intervene post hoc to mitigate the damages, but always reactively in the mode of catch up and without disturbing the owner's fundamental prerogatives. Because they are always a step behind the emitters of greenhouse gases, 
environmental regulations are easily subverted by corporate workarounds. And because they leave intact the structural divisions that license private firms to organize production, they do not alter the fundamental fact the system gives capitalists motive, means, and opportunity to savage the planet. So it is they, and not humans in general, who have brought us global warming, but not by chance or simple greed. Rather, the dynamic that has governed their actions and led to that outcome is baked into the very institutional structure of capitalist society. So whichever formulation we start with, the conclusion we reach is the same. Capitalistically organized societies carry an ecological contradiction in their DNA. They are primed to precipitate what we think of as natural catastrophes, which occur periodically, but not accidentally throughout their histories. And so these societies harbor a built-in tendency to ecological crisis. They generate ecosystemic vulnerabilities on an ongoing basis as part and parcel of their modus operandi. Although not always acute or even apparent, these vulnerabilities pile up over time until a tipping point is reached and the damage bursts forth into view. I shall consider some historical examples uh, in tomorrow's lecture. Here though, I've been stressing the structural character of this tendency. And the point is all important, not least for its practical entailments. To say that capitalism's ecological problem is structural is to say that we cannot save the planet without disabling some core defining features of our social order. What is needed first and foremost is to wrest the power to dictate our relation to nature away from the class that currently monopolizes it so that we can re reinvent that relation from the ground up. But that requires dismantling the system that underpins their power, the military forces and property forms, the pernicious ontology of value, and the, resentless, the relentless dynamic of accumulation, all of which work together to drive global warming. Ecopolitics must, in sum, be anti-capitalist. Now that conclusion is conceptually significant as it stands, but it still doesn't tell the whole story. To complete the picture, we need to consider. Oh my God, I made a short, short comment. So I so need to go to the toilet real quick soon. Um, sad, um, sad gamer moment um, of today was, um, I was finally um, creating an OnlyFans account um, because I wanted to sub to somebody. Um, I um, fell down the loot and suggestive ASMR to um, OnlyFans pipeline and only to discover um, that you need a credit card. You, you need to enter credit card information even if you want to sub to like free accounts where you don't have to pay anything. And yeah, so that's kind of a bummer. Uh, that was today's gamer moment. Um, yeah. Uh, what did I also want to say? Mm, oh yeah. Um, I have ordered the book. Um, um, the the one where we watched the Versa book launch and the. And the interview with Bastani, um, the one Planet on Fire, Planet on Fire, um, Manifesto for an Age of Environmental Breakdown. I thought, yeah, I, I ordered that because I didn't find any, any EPUBs yet and I wanted to read it. And I also found um, there is a Marx, there is like a Marxist, like, yeah, Mar intersectional Marxist um, journal that I have also like the um website um saved and it's called specter and they are bringing out um in a few weeks or something a new a new um issue sadly you need to sub to even gain access digitally to them i will think about it i don't know 
and there's gonna be um there's gonna be an interesting like interesting sounding article by Thea Rio Franco's Andreas Mom and Gareth Dale um, on eco socialism after the pandemic. So yeah. And let's continue. And I'm also gonna go to the toilet. Ah, come on. Consider some additional structural features of capitalist society that also impact nature and the struggles surrounding it. What is crucial here is a point I alluded to earlier, and one that Brigitte uh, uh, mentioned in uh, her earlier words. Nature is neither the only non-economic background condition for a capitalist economy, nor the only site of crisis in capitalist society. Rather, as I already noted in passing, capitalist production also relies on social reproductive and political prerequisites. And these arrangements too, as Karl Polanyi would have noted, are also contradictory, no less than the arrangements surrounding nature with which they interact in ways that we ignore at our peril. These relations too must be included in an eco-critical eco theory and eco-critical politics of capitalist society. Let me first ask you to consider briefly the social reproductive conditions for a capitalist society. Here too, capitalism organizes more than production. In this case, it's about, cap it's about production's relation to the multiple forms of care work performed by communities and families, chiefly, but not only by women. Sustaining the human beings who constitute labor and forging the social bonds that enable cooperation, care work is indispensable to any system of social provisioning. But capitalism's distinctive way of organizing it is every bit as contradictory as its way of organizing nature. Here too, the system works through splitting. In this case, splitting production off from reproduction and treating the first alone as a locus of value. The effect is to license economy to free ride on society, to appropriate care work without replenishment, to deplete the energies needed to provide it, and thus to jeopardize another essential condition of its own possibility. So a social reproductive crisis too is large, or rather a tendency to social reproductive crisis is also lodged at the heart of capitalist society. And there's an analogous contradiction that dogs the relation in capitalist society between the economic and the political. On the one hand, a capitalist economy necessarily relies on a host of political supports, repressive security forces that contain dissent and enforce order, legal systems that guarantee private property and authorize accumulation, multiple public goods, that enable private firms to operate profitably. Absent these political conditions, a capitalist uh, economy could not exist. But capitalism's way of relating economy to, to polity is also self-destabilizing. Splitting off the private power of capital from the public power of states, this arrangement incentivizes the first to hollow out the second. Firms whose raison d'etre is endless accumulation have every reason to try to evade taxes, weaken regulation, privatize public goods, offshore their own operations, and thus to undermine the political prerequisites for their own existence. With the cannibal again primed to devour its own preconditions, a tendency to political crisis too is installed at the heart of, so, of capitalist society. So these are two further contradictions of capital, which also follow that 4D logic of division, dependence, disavowal. And Dick. Yes, if everybody, if anybody didn't see it yesterday here, fosters the return of nature, socialism, and ecology.
Oh, but that's really annoying. And the fucked up thing is, I because I do want to probably like game, a, uh, game a little bit, or okay, yeah, not watch a movie, but game probably a little bit. Um, that helps sometimes with regards to my headache. Um, but that will be like if the YouTube, if the fucking YouTube stream on lowest settings is really this bad. I don't know if I can even like play Halo. <laughs> like to be honest, I have no idea what's going on. Uh yeah. Oh and also um I also um signed up today to a seminar on degrowth the end of May. Um which I'm interested in, like, yeah, let's see, it's basically just, it's basically just, okay, what's degrowth, and, um, Ryder Left supposedly needs it, um, I'm interested, and let's see, and yeah. And destabilization. If you consider them in this light as analytical abstractions, they closely parallel the ecological contradiction I've dissected here. But that formulation misleads. The three contradictions do not in fact operate in parallel, but rather interact with one another and with the economic contradictions diagnosed by Marx. In fact, the interactions among them are so intimate, so mutually constitutive that none of them can be fully understood in isolation from the others. So let's return briefly to the work of social reproduction, which is deeply concerned with matters of life and death. Care of children encompasses not only socialization, education, and emotional nurturance, but also gestation, birthing, postnatal tending to bodies, and ongoing physical protection. In the same way, care for the sick and the dying is focused on healing bodies and easing pain as well as on providing solace and ensuring dignity. And everyone, young or old, sick or well, depends on care work to maintain shelter, nutrition, and sanitation for the sake of physical well-being as well as for social connection. What I'm saying then is that social reproductive work aims to sustain beings who are simultaneously natural and cultural. Confounding that very distinction this work manages the interface of sociality and biology, community and habitat. So it's no surprise that social reproduction is intimately entwined with ecological reproduction, which is why so many crises of the first are also crises of the second, and why so many struggles over nature are also struggles over care and ways of life. When capital destabilizes the ecosystem that support human habitats, it simultaneously jeopardizes caregiving, as well as the livelihoods and social relations that sustain it. When people fight back, conversely, it is often to defend the entire eco-social nexus at a single stroke, as if to defy the authority of capital's institutional divisions. I think we eco-critical theorists should follow their example. We cannot adequately understand capitalism's ecological contradiction unless we think the latter together with its social reproductive contradiction. Although the system works to separate both nature and care from economy, it simultaneously sets in motion extensive interactions among them. And these deserve a prominent place in the eco-critical theory of I'm sorry. All of this will change soon when I have my real PC. Give me money so you can say you contributed to me having like significantly better streaming equipment. Yeah. 
You can then later, when I'm famous, always, always, um, like, point that out. And I will always have to, um, that's like an investment in, in a cloud, actually. I will always have to shout you out until the end of time. Capitalist society. The same point holds for the ecological and the political, which are also intimately linked in capitalist societies. It's after all, public powers, usually states, that supply the legal and military might that enables capital to expropriate natural wealth gratis or on the cheap. And it is to public powers that people turn when ecological damages become so immediately threatening that they can no longer be ignored. It is states, in other words, that capitalist societies task with policing the boundary between economy and nature, with promoting or restraining development, with regulating or deregulating emissions, with deciding where to cite toxic waste dumps, whether and how to mitigate their effect, whom to protect and whom to place in harm's way. So we can't hope to resolve the ecological crisis without also resolving the political crisis of our current form of capitalist society. The ecological is entangled finally with capital's constitutive division between exploitation and expropriation, a division that corresponds roughly to the global color line. This is a division that marks off populations whose social reproduction cost capital absorbs through the payment of wages from those whose labor and wealth it simply seizes without compensation. Whereas the first are positioned as free rights bearing citizens able to access at least some level of political protection. The second are constituted as dependent or unfree subjects enslaved or colonized in certain periods, unable to call on state protection stripped of means of self-defense or actionable rights. Now, expropriation has also served as a method by which capital accesses energy and raw materials very cheaply, if not for free. The system develops and expands in part by annexing chunks of nature for whose Oh god, I will... This is so annoying and I'm not really enjoying it myself. With my headache, that's getting more and more annoying. Um, I think, like, I will end it soon. <laughs> by which I mean the stream. No, no, no worries. <laughs> eh? Um, yeah, let's just hope. Uh, this goes, she's like finished soon and then I can't stop and yeah. And what I'm holding here in my hand is Kate Soper's Post Growth Living an for an Alternative Hedonism. Um, I know Andreas Malm in his Progress of the Storm positively referenced Kate Soper a lot of times. And I find that, like, especially the, the question of the relation between, like, hedonism, consumerism, and, um, like, uh, uh, post-growth or degrowth or something like that, very interesting. And, yeah. So, let's, let's see. It's reproduction, it does not pay. In appropriating nature, however, capital simultaneously expropriates human communities for whom the confiscated materiel and befouled surrounds constitute a habitat, their means of livelihood, the material basis for their social reproduction. These communities thus bear a hugely disproportionate, disproportionate share of the global environmental load. Their expropriation affords other let, shall we say, whiter communities, the chance to be sheltered at least for a while from the worst effects of capital's cannibalization of nature. 
So the system's built-in tendency to ecological crisis is tightly linked to its built-in tendency to create racially marked populations for expropriation. In this case too, an eco-critical theory cannot adequately understand the first apart from the second. All told then, and I'm coming to my conclusion, I realize we're running a bit late, but I'll wrap up very quickly. All told, capitalism's ecological contradiction cannot be neatly separated from the system's other constitutive irrationalities and injustices. To ignore the latter by adopting what I think of as the reductive ecologistic perspective of single issue environmentalism is to miss the distinctive institutional structure of capitalist societies, dividing economy not only from nature, but also from state care and racial imperial, imperial expropriation the society institutes a tangle of mutually interacting contradictions, which we must track together in a single frame. So my conclusion here is that eco-politics must be not only anti-capitalist, but also trans-environmental. Now that's a tall order to be sure, but I'll conclude by suggesting that anti-capitalism and trans-environmentalism go together well in the current moment. This is a time, after all, of epochal crisis, a general crisis, a crisis of ecology, to be sure, but also one of economy, society, politics, and as we know very well, sitting where we are, public health. That is, a ge general crisis whose effects metastasize everywhere, shaking confidence in established worldviews and ruling elites, hence therefore also a crisis of hegemony. In this situation, safeguarding the planet requires building a counter hegemony, an eco-political common sense that can orient a broadly eco-societal transformation. This common sense must identify exactly what in society must be changed to stop global warming, but it must also transcend the merely environmental, if one can speak that way, addressing the full extent of our general crisis. It must connect its ecological diagnosis to other vital concerns, including livelihood insecurity, denial of labor rights, public disinvestment from social reproduction and chronic undervaluation of care work, ethno-racial imperial oppression and gender and sex domination, dispossession, expulsion and exclusion of migrants and so on. Far from treating global warming as a trump card that overrides everything else, a counter hegemonic perspective must trace that threat to underlying societal dynamics that also drive other strands of the present crisis. Only by addressing all major facets of this crisis. Okay, we're already over. Um, I do, I did like the talk, especially the point that you made with like uh, not treating um, climate change. It's like this trump card that just says, okay, everything else is irrelevant now. Let's just cha let's just focus on the environmental issue. That is like okay, that is basically an apology for not talking and not wanting to an not wanting to analyze like what is it that then drove those this climate change. Um, another thing that I almost forgot that I I found very interesting. Um, in like a general perspective of seeing uh, capitalism not only as an economic system but also as like okay hey also seeing it as a system that organize that like um is dependent upon specific environmental inputs and um or conditions you might say i prefer the the word inputs because it's more like in the systems theory side and not on like the logical side um, um, but they basically mean roughly the same. I think inputs just has the better emphasis and is less misunderstandable. Um, 
and um, that um, so what I want so I think that is a great like that is a good um, starting point if like also for strategic thought like first of all what she said okay that too you can then um, analyze the contradictory or self undermining nature of capitalism with regards to its environmental conditions. Um, and environmental simply means like an, in a systems theory, like system and environment, not environmental only as in like nature. Like nature and environment are mostly like, like nature is one form of environment, but not only. Like also like environment of, ca of the system of capitalism would also be like profoundly, profoundly social stuff. Like for example, um, Ca like um, uh, care work that's thought of as non-economic, for example, you wouldn't call this nature, but still the environmental and environmental factor of capitalism as an economic system. Um, and so, when, so you can then analyze this, like self-undermining nature, what you would call then the metabolic rift. But also, I think what you can do with regards to strategic or with strategic thought that's oriented not only in like analyzing crises and how they how they emerge and develop and if they necessarily develop at one point in time um you can which is also incredibly important for strategic thought in order to diagnose okay when will there be moments of openings and um for then like action to take place but also you can diagnose, I think, um, you don't, because then you don't have to um, immediately like reform or change specific aspects of capitalism, where you would say, okay, hey, we have to change these and that aspects, and um, rather in the long or in the short run, um, and only then we can actually make some impactful change. Because you now know that capitalism depends upon specific environmental conditions and input, like inputs. And if you change something in the environment of capitalism, um, so that capitalism doesn't get these inputs anymore from its environment, then something also will change. And this is maybe, I think this is, like when I say something will change, that can also mean, okay, new forms, new social forms in the environment that like develop, that like um, give capitalism this input that has been lost from like the old source. Um, that can also be the case, of course, like that can also happen. Um, and you should be worried about that. Um, but um, um this would be like a way where you could like have a have a perspective on how to achieve strategic social change or how also to like diagnose because like not everything has to happen of course in like a directed strategic manner that like okay you can just see oh something changed there that we think of as like not an economic thing but still okay what are then the effects of that thing that's not economic on the economy um on like a structural level. Um, I think that's very, very, like, I think that's a very, very important, because this then shows us new openings, new possibilities on how, like, what would, what could be a potential uh, part of a of revolutionary strategy, or like, large scale social transformation strategy let's say just revolution because it simply means okay changing the system rather than like okay ref reforms that just alleviating the system yeah um yeah let's that's this was my key key thought here which i found very interesting let's continue environmental and non-environmental and by disclosing the connections among them can we envision a counter hegemonic perspective, a counter hegemonic block of political forces that backs a common project and possesses the political heft to pursue it effectively? That conclusion will gain some additional support when we shift the focus to history as I intend to do 
in tomorrow's lecture, but that's all enough for today. Thank you very much for your attention and for honoring me with this uh, wonderful um, uh, uh, visiting professorship and the inauguration of a terrific program that I know will continue brilliantly for years to come. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, I'm thinking if I'm tomorrow, like if I'm, I hope I feel better. <laughs> I get, I, I think so. Um, um, that tomorrow I could like recount the key points that I made, especially like what I drew from this lecture. Um, I think the lecture was actually pretty, pretty good. Um, what would be interesting would be to know where the, where are the points where her approach may start to crumble or what are like like prominent criticisms of this that actually make sense like that would be very interesting to know um so what i would like is to maybe watch tomorrow the q and a of this and then to continue tomorrow with the second lecture um probably um maybe i'm having maybe i'll have like um like co phone call and halo playing with a friend where I have to like postpone streaming or just like say, okay, I don't stream tomorrow at all. And then I will revisit this um, like another day as a video of the second lecture. Um, yeah, let's, maybe I will also watch the, the Jacobin lecture on video. Yeah. Um, I know this is much less like commentary stuff from me but I think it's actually quite good. Like it, it may, it may feel very different from what I usually do. And, um, but I think it's actually cool to just share, um, stuff that I would normally myself consume then and think about. And then I just, maybe that I have to elaborate on something actually helps me to get my thoughts clear clearer than I would just like listen to this in my own free time. Um, and also because I comment on this, this gives like my more abstract reflections a little bit more like content, like because it has something to work with. And I can show you also that my reflections don't just um, exist in a void, but are able to have like actual relation to like other stuff that's already going on and that it can enter like can that we can learn from connecting those and yeah um okay i think i really ended here like we're really really so soon today just because i'm not that well uh but hey we nevertheless did two hours where like 40 minutes were like fucking ass boring academic formalities um, let's just, let's just, um, hope that Halo works so I can distract myself a little bit and then go to, go to bed really soon. And yeah, peace out everybody. Have a good, have a good evening.